if I'm doing an accent that's unusual, I have to find a voice that really works that I can latch onto and then I can sort of develop it from there. It's tricky with the royal family because they all do sound sort of terribly, terribly like that. And you think, is that really how they talk? Like they talk like that all the time, you know? <laughs> Apparently they do. The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Well, the script was sent to me. Uh, I read it. I absolutely loved it. I had not long been out of a couple of TV shows, so it wasn't that I was looking specifically for things that were different, but the idea of something that was quite different was very appealing to me. And I then went in and had a meeting with Stefan Elliott, our director. It wasn't really an audition. And he said, how would you feel about doing this? Would you be uncomfortable? And I went, no, it's be pretty great. And then I was offered it. A desert holiday, let's pack the drag away. You take the luncheon tea, I'll take the ecstasy. There are two characters, I suppose. The character of Adam, he's so sort of over the top and so kind of pushy and obnoxious and irreverent that all the energy, in a way, goes into, into that character. And then the energy that's in the other character, in Felicia, the performing drag queen, is all about the dance moves and the choreography. Walk out the door. I was dance captain on the film, so I was in charge of rehearsals with Stefan and, and Hugo, and they did not learn their steps as well as they were supposed to have. I'm not really a dancer, so, you know, everything, everything I did I had to learn. We did a lot of research, we went to a lot of drag shows, we uh, got introduced to lots of drag queens, and one of the things that Stefan wanted to do was on the last day of rehearsal, we were going to do our camera tests and makeup and wardrobe tests. And the plan was that, that at the end of that day, we were all going to go out that night in Sydney to some clubs in full drag and just sort of cast us out into, into the world of the public, uh, which we did. And um, that really was a you know eye-opening experience for everybody. We didn't yeah. perform, we just got drunk. Very clever. Cheers, girls. And congratulations, Mitzi, darling. You did it. One lap of the Broken Hill main drag in drag. The whole thing was a funny story. It was about turning up in these towns like Broken Hill and Kings Canyon and various towns across Australia where certain townsfolk were prepped that a film was coming, but they didn't really know what it was and they wanted to get a lot of reactions from locals. So quite often the locals were told, OK, our main characters are going to sort of come walking down the street and you guys are going to watch and they would sort of put the cameras on them and you'd see these people just seeing these drag queens for the first time, country towns that had not seen anything like this before. And this is in 93 as well, you've got to remember. So there's some pretty great, honest reactions <laughs> by, by some locals. What are you all looking at? The village people asked me to go on tour with them in drag. It was a work opportunity that came up <laughs> after that film. I didn't take them up on it. Uh, funnily enough. Of course I was really then keen to just keep doing what I wanted to do which was to play a lot of different roles. LA Confidential. One of the first films I did after Priscilla was LA Confidential and everyone kept saying oh is it because Curtis saw Priscilla and Curtis never saw Priscilla he never wanted to see Priscilla He's, until the you know even till the day he passed away he still never saw Priscilla <laughs> which I was kind of thankful for because he may not have cast me as Ed Exley. Had he seen Felicia Jolly Goodfellow? Come on, guys, let's get him! Hey, Stensland, the party's upstairs. This doesn't cons concern you. The great thing about Hi, that film, I mean, obviously the script was really wonderful, but there was a book that James Ellery had written, as we all know, called LA Confidential, that covers an eight year period. So there's a whole slew of um, story, narrative that doesn't exist in the film for me to sort of wade through tons and tons of backstory about the character and then also what sort of happens afterwards. And I spent a number of weeks in LA preparing and we were driven around by a couple of cops and taken to some pretty bad areas and told lots of stories of being a cop in LA and you, you just slowly sort of immerse yourself in all of that. This should be it. The character that I played in that film was a new kind of cop, I guess. 404. Ed's father had been a well-renowned detective and Ed sort of wanted to follow in his footsteps, but he came from a more highly educated background and, and was on some level therefore treated as a bit of an outcast in the police force. So in a way he was different to the other cops. Excuse I realise this is difficult. Give your career a rest. Leave her alone. A naked guy with a gun? You expect anyone to believe that? Get the f*** away from me. I was always really pleased to be working with Russell. He's so brilliant and has such a dynamic energy on screen and he's a Kiwi and I'm English but we both grew up in Australia so there's a sort of a connection there. He was far more advanced in his career than I was but I felt that he, you know, was very helpful to me and the scenes with Kim as well were really touching because she was so lovely but the whole thing was a really wonderful experience because 
Curtis, particularly our director, had such a great ability to sort of communicate in the differently to each actor in relation to how that particular actor needed to sort of communicate. So it really was like going to film school for me, that film. He taught me so much about film acting. Memento. It's a film that obviously comes up with me a lot and comes back all the time. And film students talk about it a lot. And a lot of people say to me, it really was the first film of its kind. Funnily enough, people say to me, LA Confidential was the last film of its kind and Memento was the first film of its kind. So I feel really honored to be part of those two films. But Chris Nolan clearly is a genius and his ability to write that story and make the film that was in his head as it is. I mean, it's the only film I've ever really done, I think, where the finished film is exactly as the script was. Yo, Lenny! I thought you split for good. Well, things change. So I see. My name's Teddy. I guess I've told you about my condition. Only every time I see you. It was just an incredible honor to be working with somebody who was so clever. And the great thing about Chris was, you know, his ability to really proficient with the technical side of filmmaking, as well as the emotional journey of each character and being able to sort of communicate with us. So that was also a real lesson in filmmaking, working with him. There were 25 or 26 tattoos. We didn't see all of them all the time, so it was only a few times that you actually saw them all applying these tattoos. We sort of had transfers, essentially, but it took a, a good hour or so to get them all on. <laughs> well, Sammy Jenkins. I guess I tell people about Sammy to help them understand. Sammy's story helps me understand my own situation. Well, Sammy wrote himself endless amounts of notes. We shot the whole film in 26 days, and all that black and white stuff was scheduled to be the last two days of the shoot. And I was rehearsing those scenes on my own in my motel room every weekend when we were having breaks in between filming. And I kept saying to Aaron Ryder, our producer, I said, we're not gonna get all that in just two days. This is, it's a lot of stuff I'm doing because I'm folding notes and tattooing and on the phone and there's just tons of stuff I had to do. Writing on Polaroids, etc." And then in the last week or close to the last week, Aaron said, we've, we've got a third day. Oh, it's amazing what a little brain damage will do for your credibility. You know the truth about my condition, officer? You don't know anything. Thankfully, when Chris, my agent, sent me the letter and the script, he, at the bottom of it in brackets, he said, by the way, this all goes backwards. So I at least was sort of prepared, <laughs> prepared for that. But I, the thing was, even though it, on some level it felt like gobbledygook as I was reading it, because I got the sense that things were just all over the place, what I really got and what was really clear was the emotional journey of the character. And that, as an actor, that's the only thing I'm really not interested in, but that's what I need to latch on to in order to do my job. The other stuff sort of began to make sense more as I then worked with Chris Nolan and rehearsed with him. And then funnily enough, once it all made sense to me, I then had to sort of put it all away, let it all go, and, and, and then just treat every scene as if it was a, its own little thing, because I wasn't really to remember what had happened before or, and clearly had no clue what was coming afterwards. And of course, it also made me really question my own memory. I think back to experiences in my life where I look at something like I look at a photo and base a memory around that and go, I actually don't really know if that memory's really true, is it? <laughs> so it really made me question my, my own memory. Thanks, Chris Nolan. The Hurt Locker. Yeah, that was a quick experience, wasn't it? I was sort of reluctant to take that on at first and Catherine asked me to do it and I read it and went, well, and I had a few other things going on. I said, is it time in my career to start doing cameos? You know, have I got to that point? <laughs> and she really talked me into it because she really said, no, we really want people to believe that you're going to be the person we're going to follow through this film. And of course, if we kill you in the first five minutes, then that'll be great for the movie. I said, okay, as long as it's great for the movie, then that's great. <laughs> So if everything looks okay when I get down there, I'm just gonna set it up and we'll bip it. That bomb suit that I wore was so heavy, and we were in Jordan, of course, and it was nine million degrees, so it was really hot in there. I remember having a blood squib inside the helmet, which is obviously meant to go off as the explosion goes off, and I'm running towards camera. And they're setting it all, and sort of we're standing there in the searing heat, and it was sort of taking ages, and they're running wire, and it's this long, sort of laborious process, not complaining. And then it went off by accident in my face. So of course we had to take it all off and we had to start all over again. <laughs> and then of course the second time when they're putting it on, I'm like, oh, is this gonna go, what's gonna happen? It didn't go off the second time, but it went off obviously on camera when it was meant to, so. And then I sprained my ankle. So I was only filming for like three days. And as I finished filming, they then wanted to get all my dialogue. So I put the helmet on, we stuck a microphone in the helmet and I ran down the train track that I was sort of running on 
and I went over on my ankle and then they went, oh, are you all right? Well, we got the dialer. That's great. That's a wrap on Guy, everyone. Fantastic Guy. Thanks very much. And I'm on the ground going, oh. And I got on a plane and went to Toronto and started Traitor. And by that point, my ankle was like this. <laughs> Everyone's like, how was Hurt Locker? Yeah, it hurt. It really hurt. A lot. The King's Speech. Colin and I got him very well. We've been friends for a while and he's just the most delightful human being. He's so wonderfully articulate and eloquent and has lovely funny stories. So I just love being around him. Which was great because the dynamic between us is, is tough and it's delicate and it's quite sort of entangled in lots of you know family history. So it was a complex relationship to get right, I think. And obviously I'm not carrying the film like he is by any means, but, but it was important that that relationship was right. I've been terribly busy. Doing what? Kinging. Really? Kinging is a, a precarious business these days. Where's the Russian Tsar? Where's Cousin Wilhelm? <sighs> You're being dreary. I always have to start with the voice. I always feel like I have to find the voice and then I'm off and running a little bit. So if I'm doing an accent that's unusual, I have to find a voice that really works, that I can latch onto, and then I can sort of develop it from there. So to play a real person, if you've got an audio recording or something, it, it's absolutely priceless. I played Houdini, I played Andy Warhol, I played Edward VIII. I've played other people who are real but aren't in the public eye, so we don't really know them per se. Of course, when you play Andy Warhol, you've got tons of stuff to view. When you're playing Houdini, there's really only audio recordings and the, the sort of slow black and white or sort of super speeded up black and white stuff where you go, is that him? I can't really tell. So you, your work's cut out for you a little bit more. Uh, but obviously with King Edward, his speech, his abdication speech is, is there online. You can hear it. So it's fascinating. It's really fascinating if ever I delve into someone who's existed before. Mildred Pierce. Well, I'm about to work with the lovely Kate Winslet again. Pretty much exactly 10 years on from doing that wonderful show with Todd Haynes. That was just a delightful experience. My agent called me and said, Todd Haynes and Kate Winslet, uh, they're doing Mildred Pierce for HBO. I said, well, just say yes. <laughs> just say yes. They said, well, they'll send you the script. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. Just say yes. It's going to be great. You don't do this very often, <laughs> Mrs. Pierce. No, I should say I don't. Oh, well, I'm honored you made an exception, Mrs. Pierce. I mean, it was fantastic on a number of reasons. The script was great, Kate was great, Todd was fantastic. HBO were really wonderful. But I was in a great apartment in New York. I only worked three days a week. <laughs> so it was in summer, or leading up to summer. So everything about it was really a dream job, you know. I went to work uh, and had sex with Kate Winslet a lot. Can't complain about that. I still don't know what you do, Monty. Oh, I don't know. Fruit, I guess. My character was pretty well realised and developed in the script. There was no doubt about it. He was quite the charmer. You know, he was a cad, but he didn't come across as a con man per se. There was something sort of gently broken about him and it all felt really clear on the page. If I can get what I need for just from the script, then I sort of don't want to go too far outside of that. Obviously they had made Mildred Pierce as a film back in 1930 something or other. And I had a look at that, but then it, it, it just, it wasn't helpful. So I let it go quite quickly. I read the book as well. If there are historical characters, of course, yes, I'm wanting to listen to recordings and look at photos and uh, this, that and the other. But it's also about finding your own truth in it, I think, whatever that means. So you're not mimicking too much. Prometheus. It's very cool being part of the alien world. It's also even more cool to get to play Peter Whelan. I mean, the guy who kind of created it all. It wasn't so cool having to wear five hours of old age prosthetic makeup. Hello, friends. My name is Peter Whelan. I am your employer. You have reached your destination. And I am long dead. I would get up at two o'clock in the morning. I would be driven to work and I would start makeup at three o'clock in the morning and I'd be ready by eight and they could film with me till two in the afternoon and then I was done. And I only did about 15 or 17 days or something on that. The tricky thing about that character was I had to wear this sort of metal exoskeleton thing as well, which meant I couldn't really sit down properly. I sort of had to sort of just do this and go, mm -hmm, oh, let me know when you're ready. Mm -hmm, okay, I'll just wait here. Hold on, no, I don't want to drink, I'm fine, thanks. There was one day where I went in, did all the makeup, got to my room and they came in one day and said, we're just running a bit behind already this morning. We'll get to you shortly, we'll, we'll let you know. And I went, okay. Well, an hour went by and another hour went by and they kept popping their head in and saying, we're sure we're going to get to you, you know. And at about one o'clock, they went, 
So it's up to you. You could probably take all this off, or we might get to you. What do you think? And I'm, <laughs> by this point, I'm atrophied, frozen to the spot. And I, I don't think I filmed that day. What was more difficult was the hour that it took to get the makeup off. Or have you lost your faith? The reason why Ridley cast me was because he wanted to see a younger Peter Wayland as well. There's a scene where Michael Fassbender puts on the special goggles where he gets to talk to Peter Wayland, who's sort of cryogenically sort of having a big rest. And then through the goggles, we enter the world that Peter Wayland is dreaming that he's in whilst being cryogenically frozen or asleep. And that world, it was gonna be young Peter Wayland on a fabulous lot yacht with all these lovely, lovely ladies in the Caribbean or something like that, and Michael Fassbender would appear and we'd have this conversation. And Ridley couldn't find a yacht that he liked and then they wanted to build a yacht and they couldn't afford that or whatever happened. And they said, we'll eventually get to that scene, don't worry. And in the end they went, well, we probably don't need it. It's just fine to have Michael with his goggles on and hearing him talk and you just understand that he's talking to Peter Wayland. They could have just cast a hundred year old guy instead of me. But I'm very happy to have played Peter Wayland and I would do anything for Ridley, so that's okay. Also, just working in 3D with 3D cameras. What was funny though was Ridley coming up to sort of, because he would have to wear his 3D glasses at Video Village watching playback and then he would come up to you and give you direction with these crazy 3D glasses on and then he'd remember that he'd have to throw them down. <laughs> sort of those bloody things. Iron Man 3. With any of the sort of villains that you play, you get to the heart of where it started, why why it's occurring, you know, what the in initial intentions were, and if someone's got a chip on their shoulder and then it just sort of develops and develops and develops where somebody just needs to get revenge or needs to feel like they have a place in the world. That's great stuff to play because are they a villain or are they just kind of out of kilter and they then just get carried away with themselves? Oh, wow. Hey, Tony. Aldrich Killian. Uh, I'm a big fan of your work. My work? Aldrich Killian's a young man who's quite a science nerd, but somebody who's really rejected from society. And through the brilliance of his innovation and invention, he's able to create something that enables him to kind of morph into the most perfect version of himself and comes back a kind of a better man, supposedly a better man, you know. Pepper. Killian? You look great. You look really great. So we go from one extreme to another, which was really quite fascinating. And, and obviously people have seen the film and they know how it turns out. It's not that I actively went, I'm gonna do my fight scenes in Birkenstocks, but I just, if my feet are not on camera, then I wanna be comfortable, okay? <laughs> and I remember Robert saying to me, hey, are you wearing Birkenstocks? I said, yes. He said, I've never done a scene with anybody in Birkenstocks, let alone a fight scene. And I said, well, it's hot in here. And I, I, you know, the boots are uncomfortable and stuff. So, so yeah, thanks to Birkenstock for my comfy acting shoes. They're my acting shoes. How dare you suggest they're anything less. <laughs> Robert broke his ankle in the middle of that film because he had to do a stunt where he had to jump from one platform down to another platform and be on a cable and they wanted to rehearse it. And he said, no, I don't need to rehearse it. And he jumped and the guy holding the cable wasn't quite sort of ready or something and he landed hard and he broke his ankle. So the film sort of shut down for like five or six weeks. That's actually the second film that I've worked on where the lead actor has broken their ankle. Adam Sandler broke his ankle on Bedtime Stories, but on the weekend he was playing basketball with his nieces and nephews and broke his ankle. So I don't know if it's me. The Innocent. I've done lots of television. When I was in my teens and in my 20s, I did two television shows in Australia that were, both went for four years, so long-running TV shows. I learnt a lot and really great to work on, but not the quality, really, of the shows that are being made these days. But I still, you know, I'm an old-fashioned guy. I still prefer making films just because it's a one-off thing and it's there up on the big screen. And to be able to encapsulate a story in an hour and a half or two hours feels like a greater feat to me in a way than having the luxury of spreading it out over five or eight episodes. But that's fine too. That's the beauty of it is being able to do that. But something like The Innocence, you know, that was fascinating for all sorts of reasons. We shot in Norway, we were up in the fjords and just the most extraordinary landscape around us. <sighs> Dr. Halverson was somebody who I think also possibly like Aldrich Killian, started off with good intentions and then things got a little sort of out of hand. He's somebody who's discovered this really rare genetic condition that only exists in these Nordic women. When they are faced with a really emotional uh, or extreme kind of situation, they, as a sort of a defense mechanism, they morph into the person that they're with. <gasps> Yeah. 
And the doctor that I played is somebody who discovered this and, and really wanted to get to the bottom of it. But of course, he'd been ostracised from the British medical community in England some years before. So he felt the pressure from the outside and I think he was somebody who you felt was really sort of coming apart at the seams. It was a really interesting, odd kind of story. Yeah, and a, an odd character that I got to play. Bloodshot. My agent had the script and uh, said, I thought you might like this. And I read it and I really did enjoy it. And I had a great chat with Dave Wilson, who directs the film. And Dave, like other directors that I've spoken of, like Chris Nolan in a way, is able to really straddle the technical side of things and the emotional side of things, particularly in the visual effects world. And Dave's sort of history with visual effects is pretty impressive, but his ability to communicate with us about what the journey of each character was perfect. Lovely, lovely guy. And I just liked the story. I thought it was fascinating and this technology, which is seemingly impossible, but on some level, like great science fiction, I suppose, feels close enough that you kind of go, ah, oh, maybe it could be real, actually. That's kind of inspiring and scary at the same time. At RST, we'd rebuild the most important assets in the US military. Soldiers like yourself. Dr. Emil Harding runs this organization called RST, uh, Rising Spirit Technologies. And he is basically taking wounded soldiers, injured soldiers, or perhaps even dead soldiers, and improving them fixing what's not right. So if someone's lost a pair of legs through a, an explosion or someone's lost their sight or someone's lost their ability to breathe, the breathing apparatus that he then creates for that person or the new ocular vision technology that's implanted into the, uh, one particular character or the new legs that somebody else receives means that then they're almost bionic, that they then have additional abilities beyond what a normal pair of legs or eyes might initially give you. And of course, Vin Diesel plays Ray Garrison, a soldier who has died, who has now been brought back to life. And through this technology that's basically running through his entire body, he is now essentially a superhuman being. Do you remember anything? Vin, like Robert Downey or Adam Sandler or any of these kind of guys, are super famous who have a, an entire sort of industry around them. I just always find that fascinating because I just sneak into work and do my thing and then sit in the trailer or whatever and then pop on the set and I'm just do it all on my own. And whereas those guys always have a real kind of entourage. He's a really warm hearted, funny guy and he's very aware of the Vin Diesel sort of franchise, I guess. So we had a bit of a laugh about that at times. Initiate sequence. I always hope whenever I start reading a script that I'm going to read something I've not read before. And if I feel that, then that's always really engaging. I always just want to be surprised, I suppose. Even if I'm playing a character that might be similar to something that I've done before, there just needs to feel like there's a new way in for me, I guess. Yeah. <laughs>